I want to thank the uh, organizing committee members for allowing me to substitute for Roy Martin. He originally was going to give this presentation, but for health reasons is unable. I, I'm going to mention something about him in, in, the, in a couple of slides. So I, I'm presenting review of dietary resistant starch mechanisms, mainly from animal uh, models. And uh, these are disclosures. So. Uh, our group has been funded by Ingredion Incorporated. Previously, they were known as National Starch, and we've had funding. And uh, so what, uh, to eliminate bias, well, what I'm presenting is our research and other uh, lab groups' research that has been published for the most part. I am presenting a couple new things that are, that are unpublished. Um, and we've also received funding from federal agencies at very rigorous uh, review process. And just to mention Roy, Roy and I have, uh, he, Roy used to be at uh, Louisiana State University with me years ago. He's now at uh, UC Davis at the USDA Center. We still collaborate, but he's having some health problems. He's uh, hoping that his sister will be able to uh, donate a kidney and they're evaluating her health to be able to do that and then he expects to look 20 years younger he says when he gets a new kidney. All right so today uh, I'm going to be talking about a few things. First of all some of the exciting uh, times we're in doing research with uh, resistant starch and other fermentable fibers. So resistant starch isn't the only one you know fermentable fiber very important. Uh, then talk about what is resistant starch then how, how did we begin doing resistant starch uh, research, uh, research? Is resistant starch effective in humans? Just mentioning that, and then Denise Robertson is going to talk more about that next. Uh, then talk about beyond energy dilution, you know, into the, the fermentation effects. And then uh, mention of some things where uh, models where resistant starch has not been effective in making uh, phenotypic or physiological changes. And then summarize. So first of all, excitement about research. Uh, I'm actually more excited than ever about uh, resistant starch and other fermentable fiber research. Um, the research that's grown with the microbiota in the last 10 or so, 15 years, and omics, the measurement of so many metabolites and, and other, other types of chemicals, uh, has led to uh, knowing many reasons for the benefits of fermentable fibers. And I, I even use, uh, anecdotally, I, I use it, I have a short bowel, and I use it to produce uh, more uh, GLP-2 naturally that increases absorption. Uh, about 15 years ago, the, the main focus for fermentable fibers seemed to be on GLP-1 and PYY. And PYY is peptide YY, glucagon-like peptide 1 is GLP-1. And they're uh, shown to reduce hunger, increase metabolic activity, and improve insulin sensitivity. And a lot of, uh, and, and probably the major focus has been GLP-1 because it's called an incretin hormone because it enhances the insulin effect. And then on this slide, uh, what you can see is, what, what you have is, you have a, a proglucagon gene that results in the GLP-1 and GLP-2, and uh, then it, you produce proglucagon messenger RNA and then a proglucagon peptide. And then post-translational modification in the pancreas and the alpha cells produce glucagon and a couple other small things, but mainly glucagon. And in the intestine and brain, you produce GLP-1, GLP-2, and oxyntomodulin. Okay. And, but, you know, the, that's not the only answer, the, the GLP-1 and the PYY. Uh, Short-chain fatty acids directly. At first they thought, well, most of them would be taken up by the epithelial cells. Maybe none will reach past the liver and into the systemic circulation. Um, but they actually get past there. But uh, there is some work Denise Robertson's done with the GLP-1 uh, with resistant starch and GLP-1 not increasing. But you can see here that, uh, 
See? What you see here is the short chain fatty acids can have a direct effect on the liver reducing gluconeogenesis. And so even without uh, stimulation of uh, GLP-1, you can still have some uh, improved glucose control. So that's interesting. And then the main three uh, short chain fatty acids are acetate, which is two carbons, propionate three carbons, and butyrate four. There's many, there's several others, and there's many metabolites, but those are your three main short chain fatty acids. And so short chain fatty acids have been shown uh, to bind to receptors of immune cells and, and regulate the immune system. And uh, a recent talk that I saw at Experimental Biology, and then I, I looked up the paper, is that uh, blood pressure can be regulated by short-chain fatty acids. And you have, you have two different receptors, the GPR41 and the OLFFR78, that uh, at different levels of propionate uh, become active. Uh, and that helps to increase or decrease blood pressure. And propionate seems to be the... Uh, a, the key uh, short-chain fatty acid for the blood pressure regulation. And then the production of uh, derivatives of bile acids by uh, the microbiota, the bacteria in the gut, uh, uh, appear to bind to, uh, again, uh, receptors in, in the immune system and regulate, and regulate the immune system. And, just, uh, and also experimental biology back in the spring uh, Randy Seeley presented data about vertical sleeve gastrectomy. It shows here where they cut uh, uh, the back portion of the stomach and you just have this uh, sleeve, they call it. And what happened, they saw that you, with those patients, they increase bile acid absorption and they bind to FXR and uh, another name for that is BAR, bile acid receptor and it prevents uh, obesity even on a high-fat diet. And they've done work with uh, uh, mice and shown that uh, with a, a vertical sleeve gastrectomy, they're uh, resistant to high-fat diet-induced obesity. And so the signaling through that receptor uh, via bile acids and probably metabolites of bile acids, uh, that's exciting. And then uh, dendritic cells that are part of the immune system actually can sense uh, the bacteria and metabolites of the bacteria products um, uh, you know, from the lumen of the intestine. So a lot of interaction and, and uh, you know, the, the, so these fermentation products uh, can affect the host uh, organism's health. And then this was done in Zucker diabetic fatty rats, and uh, uh, we fed four diets. And uh, this one here is a whole grain flour high RS. This is a purified resistant starch, just a starch. This is a whole grain with low RS. It's the flour. And then this is a purified control. And what's exciting, see, Ferulic acid was increased, and it's a polyphenol derivative, and a very important antioxidant. And it's the amount was vastly increased with whole grain, but especially vastly increased with high RS. Now, so I did a little introduction about some of the things I think are exciting. And now, what is resistant starch? Well, structurally, starch comes in two, pri two primary forms, amylose, which is a straight chain, and amylopectin with, with branches. Uh, and generally, amylose is resistant to digestion because the terminal units of the straight chain, the ends, uh, fold into starch granules that don't allow the amylase enzyme to uh, uh, digest it. And one way to view resistant starch is defined as uh, what reaches the large intestine is fermented to short-chain fatty acids and, as I mentioned, probably many other products. And there's four types of resistant starch, RS1, basically whole grains, defines that just structure of the whole grains make uh, inaccessible to the en amylase enzyme. And we've used, as I showed in that slide, the high 260 whole grain flour, whole grain flour. And then RS2, uh, best, one of the best examples, high amylose cornstarch, and we've used the purified uh, cornstarch. And then RS3 is retrograded, and the be best example is cooked potatoes that are then cooled for potato salad, and you get the retrograded the RS3. 
And RS4 is if it's been chemically modified where the uh, chains are, are linked or you add substituent groups to the, to the uh, starch. Uh, another way to look at it is the in vitro uh, digestibility and if, with the enzyme mix. And, and if it's digested within 20 minutes, it's rapidly digestible starch. Uh, slowly digestible starch is digested between 20 and 120 minutes. And then resistant is greater than 120 minutes and based on the English assay, who's done a lot of work in uh, discovery of resistant starches. And then uh, this is an interesting slide. Um, uh, Chris Palkman of Ingredient was concerned we were using in a pilot human study uh, yogurt as a vehicle for the RS2 uh, resistant starch. And with pasteurization of the yogurt, thought maybe uh, we'd lose the starch granules. But uh, fortunately, the uh, person that was making the yogurt, the dairy person, didn't use the short-time, high-temp pasteurization. He used the low temperature, lower temperature, you know, the allowable lower temperature at a longer time. And you can see that the starch granules dispersed throughout the yogurt are still intact, which we were very happy to see that. Now, how did we begin doing resistant starch research? Uh, well, Roy Martin was at uh, Experimental Biology, I don't know, probably about 2001, maybe, and Jennifer Brand Miller was uh, presenting a glycemic index study and how the body fat was reduced in rodents, in rodent study. And uh, so we were going to do some research, and Marin Hegstead, who used to work with us, um, contacted Dr. Mil uh, Brand Miller, and she told us she used resistant starch to produce her low glycemic index diets. And, you know, we thought, ah, oh, maybe there's some controversy with glycemic index. I know the next, se next session is talking about it, so maybe it's not controversial. As, as We thought it was a little controversial, so we said, let's do resistant starch research. So what we did, we did what uh, Dr. Brandmiller did, and we replaced the high amylopectin starch in the rodent diets uh, with high amylose starch. And generally, we use about 25% of the weight of the diet as resistant starch. Now, when we began doing these studies, we didn't know the, the metabolizable energy value of the resistant starch product. And uh, we did some studies and got very dramatic results. So this slide shows you know, several different amounts. And at 32% of the weight of the diet, quite a bit, in Sprague Dolly rats, male, 12 weeks of study, we had a 61% reduction in abdominal fat, okay? So that, that's very impressive. And I'm gonna, but that's a lot of resistant starch. You know, a lot of people replacing the, star, the, the uh, highly digestible starch. But so I wanna mention briefly, w would this be effective in humans? And so Anthony Bird's group uh, showed that body fat in, in uh, obese-prone and obese-resistant Sprague Dolly rats was reduced, significantly reduced at 8% of the weight of the diet. However, they were doing both energy dilution and fermentation effects, because when you add resistant starch, uh, you're going to dilute the energy and you'll, you'll get fermentation. Um, but it, it, they didn't use isocaloric diet, control diets. Um, George Fahey of the University of Illinois has talked to me quite a bit, and we, he, he says, he's calculated roughly that about 10% of the weight of the diet is equivalent, roughly equivalent to the human fiber requirement. So if humans meet their fiber requirement with a good amount of fermentable fiber, maybe, maybe they'll be able to reduce body fat. But when you look at the literature, on human studies, and I, I found a good review in Advances, uh, Advances in Nutrition, uh, Dr. Diane Burke of, Bird of Iowa State, she basically states that more long-term studies with resistant starch in humans are needed. There's just to see if there is reduced body fat, body weight, and increased fat oxidation. So that's wide open to be able to show, if you can show that. Uh, Dr. Denise Robertson has done some very uh, nice studies in humans with uh, one study with 30 grams per day of resistant starch and one with 40 and saw improved insulin sensitivity. However, it's interesting that, and I mentioned it earlier, that she doesn't see increased GLP-1 for the treated group. 
And at first I thought, well, what's, what's going on? No GLP-1, what's, how could that be going on? And what we found is there's a nice review at our article by Ginadal in 2008 that talks about a, a transcription factor that interacts with the promoter region of the proglucagon gene for production of GLP-1 and GLP-2. And uh, if it's defective, um, then you produce low or no GLP-1. Um, and, and having that allele uh, is associated with type 2 diabetes. And so this demonstrates that increased production of GLP-1 uh, appears not to be required for improved insulin sensitivity with consumption of resistant starch. So other things like short-chain fatty acids and other metabolites would be having that effect, would be part of the mechanism. Now, we did, we did a study recently published um, that where we used citagliptin, which is a DPP-4 inhibitor, and DPP-4 enzyme degrades GLP-1 active to inactive form. And we combined it with resistant starch, both to see you know, greater effects on GLP-1 production. And what, what we found was in the, we used GLP-1 receptor knockout in wild-type uh, mice, and the wild-type mice had better fasting glucose with the resistant starch citagliptin combination, and they had reduced abdo abdominal fat. However, the GLP-1 receptor knockout mice, no effect on the fasting glucose, no effect on the abdominal fat mass, but they had very high GLP-1 GLP to try and overcome not having the receptor. And uh, so it looks like we, we hypothesized from this that maybe you don't need increased GLP-1, but to uh, uh, have it, you know, improved insulin sensitivity, glucose control, you may at least need the GLP-1 receptor. And then another thing that's important is you'd probably, you'd need, need to be able to ferment resistant starch to have the greatest effect. And this is work from Jens Walter's group and uh, show that there was one subject who used RS4 and RS2 and for all the subjects, and these X's means no, no bacteria produced, and if it's a small circle, le you know, less, and compared to other subjects, they appear not to ferment because they're not producing uh, the same amount of uh, types of bacteria in the microbiota. All right, so now get into a little bit more of our research on beyond energy dilution. And so uh, important, we think, to use isochloric diets to study fermentation effects. So we wanted to go beyond just having energy dilution because you can use any fiber. You could grind up plastic beads. Peterson and Baumgart did that work in the 70s. And you dilute dietary energy. And that's important. But we wanted to study fermentation without energy dilution. And so what we had to do first, we had to fig determine, we used bomb calorimetry and we teamed up with another group in the publication, did another method, but we, we, our group used bomb calorimetry to figure out the energy value of the uh, high maze 260 product, 2.8 kilocalories per gram. This allowed us to do isochloric diet studies and perform mechanistic proof of concept studies on fermentation effects. And so this, this slide shows three different studies um, that that show the effect of fermentation reducing body fat. The black slides, the black bars are resistant starch, and the white bars are the isochloric control or EC energy control. So this is not an effect of energy dilution as a result of just fermentation. And then um, what we have here is that this was in this was in black six mice, and we see that with the resistant starch, again the black bars, we have a reduced respiratory quotient which means the lower it is, the more fat burning. So fat burning is increasing. Uh, we have uh, significant oxygen consumption in the dark cycle, and it's almost significant at 0.07 in the 24 hours, and then heat production, almost significant, 0.07 for dark and... Uh, and, then, and then this just shows, this slide just shows short-chain fatty acids producing the PYY and GLP-1, and they affect... Uh, uh, neurons in the brain that, that affect energy expenditure and food intake, and then a graduate student measured the pro the POMC uh, gene expression in arcuate nucleus hypothalamus, and it significantly increased, so that's probably why the energy expenditure. 
And then we, NPY and AGRP gene expression were increased not significantly, but that's maybe why we don't see reduced food intake with resistant starch. We actually see a little more. And then we've, we've got a couple animal models, the endocrine obesity, ovariectomized, and sham had reduced uh, uh, abdominal fat to body weight percent. Uh, we hit show improved uh, home IR uh, with uh, Goto Kakazaki lean model type of type 2 diabetes. And here we show just short chain fatty acids increase I talked about earlier. And then this slide shows that we, we show, what we did was measure GLP-1 and PYY over 24 hours, and it was increased at all points. And this may explain why we're not seeing a satiety effect, because you don't see the meal effects, because they're always fermenting, and they're they have these high, high levels of the hormone. One, when re resistant starch is not effective, this is Zucker diabetic fatty rats I mentioned earlier. And what you see on this slide, several graphs just showing that fermentation was very robust. Whole grain flour with high resistant starch was fermented better than the purified but we saw no difference in abdominal fat percent. Uh, but we may see some insulin sensitivity. My graduate student, to get normalization of data, threw out very low, uh, val two low values here and one here, so we could do normal statistics. And you see the mean comparison shows a difference, but the overall ANOVA was 0.08. So there may be some improvement in insulin sensitivity. And this just shows the microbiota very quickly, and you see the, the, uh, the high, the high resistant starch is here and separates from the low resistant starch along the x axis, and then the whole grain separates uh, along the y axis from the purified starch. And this is just all the bands for the four groups. Here's the high RS whole grain, and you see uh, the whole grain low RS has very high lactobacillus that's decreased in the high RS. And then this, this just shows that there's, uh, we used uh, uh, obe polygenic obese mice that didn't ferment, and they had no, no response as far as body fat. We used a moderate and low-fat diets, no insulin resistance differences. And then from the pH uh, values, uh, they appear not to ferment. We didn't compare them uh, for pH to the black six because the, uh, a student ran some uh, uh, cultures and showed that low and moderate fat had equivalent bacteria. That's lactobacillus there as an example. And in summary, so fermentation of resistant starch at proof of concept dietary amounts promotes benefits of resistant starch consumption. Fermentation and dietary energy dilution combination of resistant starch may promote reduction of body fat in humans, but there are no conclusive human studies at this time. Uh, fermentation of resistant starch at 30 to 40 grams per day improves insulin sensitivity in humans, but increased serum GLP-1 appears not to be necessary. Use of GLP-1 receptor knockout mice indicate the receptor is important for reduced body fat and possibly insulin sensitivity. A functional leptin receptor uh, is necessary to reduce body fat even with robust fermentation like in ZDF rats and distinct microbiota changes, but may not, may not be necessary to improve the insulin sensitivity. If diets are isocaloric, lack of fermentation appears to limit the effects of resistant starch on body fat and insulin sensitivity and polygenic obesity. And lastly, research with short-chain fatty acids and omics is exciting, and numerous products of fermentation of resistant starch uh, by the microbiota should lead to more understanding of mechanism in the future and just shows people have worked with us. I want to thank Chris Pelkman of Ingredient, and then before her, Ann Burkett and Ian Brown when it was National Star. Thank you. One of the projects I'll present today was funded by Ingredion. Well, it was 2006, so it was part of ICI Chemicals.
But to mitigate that, all the data I'm presenting today is all from peer-reviewed publications. So where are we currently? Well, I had a, a quick look last night at the, the current American and, and UK guidelines for resistant starch. And not surprisingly, resistant starch is mentioned by the ADA, but only to say that there are no long-term published trials, and that's it. Uh, they do glance at it. But that's better than the, the British, who actually don't make any reference to resistant starch at all in their nutritional guidelines for diabetes. And these were published in 2011. So we've still got an awful long way to go to try and convince anybody to do anything really with resistant starch. Now, listening to Mike's study, you may think all the work's already been done, but it, it hasn't really. And what we do need to remember that animal models are often just hypothesis generating. They're not usually predictive of the, what the response will be in a human. And like all translational research, some of these hypotheses will prove to be proven, but other will prove to be false. And, and that's, where we, that's where we're coming from, really. In order to change public health and dietary guidelines, we have to be able to demonstrate efficacy in the target population, which is obviously the human. OK, so why do we tend to use supplements with resistant starch? Well, a lot of the, the kind of the, the criticisms by organisations such as the ADA is that a lot of the benefits are not seen until you get to very high intakes, often in excess of maybe 50 grams per day. So this is what 40 grams per day of fibre actually looks like. So if you were to sort of give this to somebody, they may be slightly overwhelmed by it, but you could give them the same amount of fibre as resistant starch, and they could quite easily incorporate it into their diet, as we tend to do with supplements, or in the future, use this as a functional food ingredient. Okay. Obviously, there are other benefits to using supplements. We can remove a lot of the effects of GI, and as Mike said, energy dilution. So we start to look at what are the metabolic, metabolic effects of resistant starch per se, which is quite important. But often, we can run them then in a similar design that we would with a, a normal randomized clinical trial. And it's very hard to do that with a normal nutritional intervention. So most of the studies I'm going to present today have been done with supplements, most of them with type 2 resistant starch, with high maize resistant starch. And although I will mention a couple that have started to use food-based research using the, the resistant starch incorporated into food products. Okay, so what we have is research from a various gradient of different sort of health status or reducing insulin sensitivity or reducing glycemic control and also in a variety of methods. Now we heard a, a bit about methods yesterday. Some methods are considered gold standard. Others aren't considered gold standard, but often these methods are very complementary to each other, and each one will tend to provide different information which we can add together to try and get an, an overall picture with what is going on. So really, I think we were probably one of the first groups to, to kick-start this sort of work with, with resistant starch back in the, the mid-2000s. And what we did is simply a, a randomised controlled trial, and Mike briefly touched on it, where we had 30 grams per day uh, of type 2 resistant starch, four weeks, we did hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamps, we also did a postprandial meal tolerance test with arteriovena, arteriovena sampling. And what we found, we found we actually, despite using what were considered reasonably healthy participants, we did get an improvement in insulin sensitivity, okay? If we'd not found anything, that probably would have been the end of my resistance starch career. Unfortunately, it worked. So that has kind of filled in the last decade of my life, really. So there's been a few follow-ups now, again with, I will call them healthy populations because they're not pure metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance, but often they're quite mixed groups. So this is a more recent study. This is a more recent study by Mackey. And what they did is they had a, a mixed group of 33 individuals. 
And when they characterized them, about 50% would have been metabolic syndrome and 50% healthy. So a bit of a mixed bag. They had men and women, and they had two different supplement periods. So it was a, a three-way crossover for four weeks. Interestingly, they found an improvement of both 15 and 30 grams per day, but only in men. They didn't find an effect in women. Okay? And that in itself is very interesting because obviously you can't have a, a dietary guideline for 50% of the population. You know, it, we need to kind of work out why was it just in men, why didn't it work in the female group. Okay, so this was with uh, intravenous glucose tolerance test. Now, these three studies are all in insulin resistance and they're all from our group. And what we tended to do, we tended to recruit people who had baseline very high fasting insulin levels. So we could almost guarantee that they had tissue insulin resistance. Okay? They tended to be normal glycemic, so they hadn't started to become impaired fasting, sort of impaired. Okay, so in these three studies, they all had the same dose, so each of them was 40 grams per day, but you'll notice that they're for different durations. So we started off with 40 grams per day for 12 weeks. Again, we used the hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp, and we found a, roughly a 20% increase in insulin sensitivity. Okay? So this was a very similar magnitude of response to what we had found with our healthy individuals. Okay? So that was all very, very positive. In the next study, we thought, right, so we did it for 12 weeks and that worked. What's the kind of the minimum length of time you would need to put someone on one of these supplements to actually find an effect? So in the next study, we again did same dosage, but this time we only did it for eight weeks. So eight weeks, again, hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp. This time we were getting a bit clever. So we added some stable isotopes to it to try and differentiate between whether it was peripheral insulin sensitivity or whether it was the sensitivity of endogenous glucose production that was changing. It turned out, again, 17%, so roughly, roughly the same magnitude of response, but the effects were entirely peripheral. There was no effect at all on liver glucose production. We did find, because this time we also incorporated it with arterial venous sampling, that we found a 65% increase in glucose flux directly into forearm tissue, which is primarily muscle. And we did find difference is in fasting glucose control. And that's the first time we'd ever found that. Usually we hadn't found any differences in fasting glucose or insulin. So the next study was four weeks. Would we get an effect after four weeks? We got an effect in healthy individuals after four weeks. Uh, no, we didn't. So we used a different methodology this time. We did the frequently sampled intravenous glucose tolerance test. No effect on insulin sensitivity at all. Okay? So very disappointing, first negative result. But we did find a, a dramatic improvement in first phase insulin response. Okay? And what we heard yesterday, often you've got that balance between sensitivity and beta cell function. There was also a, a non-significant increase in glucose effectiveness, which implied there was potentially something going on which was insulin independent. And again, we did find this drop in fasting glucose. There's been a couple of, of more recent studies, this time starting to use uh, food-based research, because realistically, if something like resistant starch is going to be used, isn't, is going to be rolled out, you're not going to want to start sprinkling powder over your breakfast cereal. You are going to want to try and bake it into products and incorporate that into people's diets naturally. So this is a, a study that's been done recently and has just been published as part of an MSC. And they used, again, type 2 resistant starch, eight weeks where the resistant starch was baked into bagels versus a controlled bagel. So again, they had an appropriate control. They found a reduction in fasting glucose control. Okay, so they did find something. Uh, another study which is slightly older, this time using bread, longer period, but a much lower dose of resistant starch, only seven and a half grams. 
and perhaps from what we experienced after 2010, not so surprising that they didn't find an effect with such a small dose. Okay. So in terms of, of our own data, there was something that happened between four weeks where we had no improvement in dentin sensitivity and eight weeks where suddenly you've got a 20% improvement. Okay, so four weeks isn't long enough, eight weeks is. We don't quite know what the optimum, optimum level is. But this is some of the, the data from that study. And so it's making us think, is this first phase insulin secretion improvement potentially an important first step in getting later improvements in insulin sensitivity. So if we look at some of the data from that study, so we have a, a mean 41% improvement in first phase insulin. We got a, a mean 30% improvement in glucose effectiveness. But interestingly, our insulin sensitivity actually went down. You know, 7%, it, it wasn't very good at all. And for those of you that are suspicious of modeling, and I'm suspicious of modeling, you know, when I review papers, I like to see the numbers, I like to see the curves and the data. We can see quite a dramatic difference in our actual C peptide raw data between the two interventions. So the resistant starch has got almost a doubling in your, in your C peptide raw data. So we were quite happy that we are getting something definite going on here with, with the insulin secretion. Now, we also tend to be getting these very large and dramatic increases in, in glucose uptake directly into forearm muscle. Okay, so this is not a postprandial level. This is actual flux when you measure it going into, into a muscle tissue directly. So in this study, we got a 60% increase in glucose uptake. And of course, that is much higher than the increases we're getting in insulin sensitivity by clamp. We don't really understand why you're getting the difference. These differences are very big. Okay? These are bigger differences than you get with many of the pharmacological treatments for diabetes. Because okay? we've done similar methodologies with, with many of the drugs, with rosiglitazone, things like that. So this is a very big, big increase. So we can only assume the difference is either to do with some sort of gut-derived factor, because this is a non-steady state, this is a postprandial test, or you've got some very non-insulin-mediated mechanism, which we haven't yet defined. Now, recently, we, we thought we would try and translate this into type 2 diabetes, because obviously this is a, a quite a, an important target group. And we thought, well, we'll go back to the, the dose and the length of intervention that we know works in insulin-resistant. So it was 40 grams per day for 12 weeks. Disappointingly, we had no effect on insulin sensitivity in this diabetic group, okay? We had no effect on endogenous glucose production, which wasn't a surprise because we hadn't in the past. We did continue to get this increased glucose uptake into muscle, despite this time no difference in, in the clamp data. We did get an improvement in postprandial glucose tolerance, so the postprandial levels were coming down and we didn't get an effect on HbA1c but the group were well controlled anyway so they were already within the target range for the UK so that's not such a surprise so when I mentioned that animals aren't necessarily a good model for humans sadly humans aren't often a very good model for humans either and I think the message is you know as if we all didn't know this you cannot extrapolate from a healthy non-diabetic individual into a response in a patient because it just doesn't seem to work. Okay, so when we look at, at, at from that data, so we have this, this dramatic, again, increase in glucose flux into muscle, but insulin sensitivity only improved in roughly half the group, you know? And what you do find is quite a lot of heterogeneity in a patient group, a lot more than you get in a healthy group. And we thought, well, is there anything about this heterogeneity that we can define based on their metabolic profile that would differentiate them to say, well, that's a responder, that's not a responder. So when we looked at their baseline sort of um, RD, so their insulin sensitivity, there was no difference at all. So we couldn't predict based on their starting insulin sensitivity who was going to respond and who wasn't. 
there have been some, some other, other starches available, other, other, other groups doing this, and it does tend to be a very mixed bag. You know, as Mike mentioned, if you're going to look at the effects of resistant starch, you need to be looking at resistant starch and not energy dilution, and you need to have an appropriate control. And some of the studies just haven't used an appropriate control. This is a, a study I did find in diabetes. So they used native banana starch for weeks, and they used a control against soy milk. No idea why you would use soy milk as your control for resistant starch, okay? Another study, they had a, a, a mixed group where they were using a, a type 4 resistant starch and they just replaced the flour in a, a Hutterite community. I had to Google that, I'd never heard of this. And it, in itself, it wasn't a badly designed trial, but nowhere in the paper did they quantitate how much resistant starch these groups were eating. So not only did they not find any effect on glycemia, they have no idea how much resistant starch they ate anyway. So it would have been very hard to extrapolate any conclusions from this. The last study was in atherosclerosis. This was a mixed group of pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Two types of rice. One they called their high glycemic, low glycemic rice with resistant starch. Very oddly described, very hard for me to tell actually what they fed them. And they did find reduced postprandial glucose but from the paper, it did look to be entirely a GI effect and not actually a resistant starch effect. Okay. And this is a, a study in Lobley. And again, there was just no control. So you, you've got nothing to compare it with. So the strongest evidence tends to come from studies where you've only really changed one variable. You've controlled for GI. And most of these to date have come from type 2 resistant starch from HAMRS. Okay. Why is it an adipose tissue mechanism? You can either have less adipose tissue, you can change the function of the adipose tissue you've got, or you can change where you stored it, you know, in three simple, simple ways. Like what Mike, so to reiterate what Mike said, despite what the animal models show, resistant starch feeding does not lead to weight loss or change in body fat mass. And this is fat mass derived by impedance or MRI. We had a, a mechanism which was set up in Oxford to look at um, adipose tissue in situ. So you would cannulate the epigastric vein, you would measure adipose tissue blood flow, and you would measure substrate flux by arterial venous difference. We were able to show quite clearly that you would get a difference in efflux of glycerol and fatty acids directly from fat tissue. So not levels, but the, the rate of fatty acids and glycerol leaving fat tissue was altered. You had reduced adipose tissue lipolysis. And we know now, as Mike mentioned, this is a mechanism based on GPR 41, 43, and potentially short chain fatty acids as ligands. And of course, because of this, once you control the insulin, and this is in a low dose insulin infusion, you're actually getting more sensitivity in the suppression of lipolysis after resistant starch, even when you've maintained or you've clamped your insulin to identical levels. What do you get when you look at biopsies? What we found, we found some interesting things, not necessarily what we'd always expect, but things like we changed things like perilipin. You've got an almost doubling of a perilipin. You've changed adiponectin, which is important for insulin sensitivity, and things like LPL. And when we add this to the find, we find a 300% increase in glucose uptake into fat tissue in vivo. It looks like you're not only getting this drive for reduced mobilization of fatty acids from fat, but also a drive towards increased storage. If you're driving storage, does that mean you're going to get less ectopic fat? That's what, that's what the textbook tells us we're going to get. And no, you don't. So when you look at that with MRI, you get no difference with hepatic fat, no difference with pancreatic fat, and muscle lipid actually increases, okay, in both insulin resistance and diabetes. And interestingly, that the muscle lipid is actually correlated with positive clinical outcomes. It was, pos it was correlated in insulin resistance with increased insulin sensitivity with CLAMP. In the diabetic group, 
the more their triglycerides in the muscle went up, the lower their HbA1c went down. The future, I'm not going to mention much about this because there's another talk on this, but there's an awful lot of work now on the microbiota, and obviously resistant starch is prebiotic and it's highly fermented, okay? And if we're producing this much feces, it must be doing something, surely. And there's an entire cascade which was proposed by the groups in Louvain, linking the bacteria with the gut barrier, with endotoxemia, and with low-grade inflammation and type 2 diabetes. This really has been understudied for resistant starch, so there's lots of potential here. We did show a reduction in TNF-alpha in our diabetic group, but obviously there's a lot of question marks which we need to, to fill in. What next? Well, it's a very small evidence base. Most of the studies are very small, but very detailed. And perhaps what we need is a much bigger study, but with more sort of defined normal clinical endpoints. Most of the starch research has been RS2. What about the other types? They might also have different effects. And we do need to work out what is the, the, what is the optimum dose times intervention length that you'd want to use. Because 40 grams is a lot you know, to try and incorporate into a diet. And obviously, we still need to try and translate into type 2 diabetes. Microbiota is important. Is it one of those things where in 10 years' time we'll have forgot it and moved on to something else? We don't know. But we do need large-scale trials if you're going to do microbiota because of the inherent variability. And do we need to keep looking at downstream targets? Because a lot of the technology, instead of looking at the composition of the microbiota, do you want to look at their functionality? Is that more important? Thank you. The title of my talk is Responders and Non-Responders, Baseline Metabolic Condition Affects Response to Resistant Starch. And the disclosures, um, this program has received financial support from the organizations listed in the program. I personally have received research grant funding from Ingredion Incorporated. Uh, they provided both the product and the funding for the study that I'm going to tell you about today. And how did we mitigate potential bias? This was an investigator-initiated study, and the investigative team was responsible for study design, data analysis, and all of the, the results that I'm going to show you today. So you've already heard quite a bit about resistant starch. It's a type of dietary fiber that has beneficial effects on insulin sensitivity. Uh, the mechanism is not fully understood, as you've seen in the earlier two presentations, there's a number of possible ways that resistant starch may act. Uh, a lot of the effects of resistant starch are attributed to fermentation in the hindgut, the production of volatile fatty acids. And these fatty acids are known to have a number of beneficial effects. Uh, one of them which I'm going to touch on briefly day, today is the possibility that they can increase synthesis and secretion of the hormone adiponectin. Uh, adiponectin is an adipocyte-derived hormone. It's produced in mature adipocytes, and it has profound insulin-sensitizing effects, both in animal models and in humans. This slide is from the Nurses' Health Study in women with type 2 diabetes, and it shows the effect of generalized dietary fiber intake on adiponectin levels. And what you can see is across the range of body mass index that we're looking at lean obese, overweight and obese individuals, greater cereal fiber intake is associated with greater serum adiponectin. There, and this is particularly striking in the lean individuals. The next slide here shows a study that was done in an animal model actually using resistant, star resistant starch as the source of dietary fiber. So these mice um, were given two different doses of resistant starch, either 18% or 
And what you can see here is the adiponectin protein content in the epididymal fat pad of the animals. And there was a significant increase in adiponectin. Sorry, this pointer doesn't work very well. But you can see in the third group, what's that? Right, um, you can see in the third group here that the adiponectin levels were significantly increased by the 36% resistant starch feeding. There have been relatively fewer studies done in humans. And Denise touched on this study earlier. Uh, this was actually the impetus for the clinical trial that I'm going to tell you about today. And that is the sex difference in response to resistant starch. This is the study by Mackey et al. It was, uh, it was done in both women and men with two different doses of resistant starch, 15 and 30 grams per day, and four-week treatment period. And as you can see, these are the results from the study broken down by sex, men on the left, women on the right. The men, this is an insulin sensitivity from an intravenous glucose tolerance test and minimal modeling. And the men responded beautifully to both doses, the 15 and the 30, with an increase in insulin sensitivity. And there was no response in the women. So the, there was some speculation as to why this uh, might have occurred. Um, one possibility is that the study was not controlled for menstrual cycle phase. There's a well-documented decrease in insulin sensitivity during the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. It's thought to be due to the elevated sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone. And it, so if you don't test consistently in one phase or another, it could muddy the waters in terms of the results. Also, the, the study included both pre- and post-menopausal women, and it didn't consider whether maybe the resistant starch worked better or differently in one group or the other. So again, the possibility that the hormonal environment was playing a role. And finally, women have much higher insulin sensitivity than women. That's not obvious from these data here because these individuals were all obese. But for anyone who's done insulin sensitivity testing, it's quite profound. Um, w without a doubt, women have much higher, even, even obese women have much higher insulin sensitivity than men. So the thought was maybe the resistant starch just, it works better in men because men start out lower. So there's an effect of baseline insulin sensitivity on the response. But this study wasn't really powered to get at that. So with that background then, the study that I'm going to tell you about had the following objectives. We wanted to look at the effects of high amylose maize resistant starch on insulin sensitivity in women, controlling for those variables that I mentioned in the last slide. We tested only during the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle. We controlled for menopausal status in the sense that we targeted recruitment of both equal numbers of pre- and post-menopausal women, and we considered menopausal status in the statistical design of the results. We also tested for an effect of baseline insulin sensitivity, high insulin sensitivity at baseline versus low. Um, and we did this, I'll show you the slides um, in a few minutes, by using a Gaussian type distribution analysis to actually objectively identify insulin. We call the low insulin sensitivity group our insulin resistant women, and then the high insulin sensitivity group our insulin sensitive women. We also recruited we, we, our target for recruitment was 50% African-American women. I live in Birmingham, Alabama, and we have a large African-American population, and this population is particularly at high risk for type 2 diabetes. My work and work of others has shown that African-Americans in general, as a group, have much lower insulin sensitivity. So we thought by enriching the subject population in African-Americans, we would be likely to include women that started out fairly insulin resistant. Uh, we also wanted to take a look at the hormone adiponectin and see if this was playing into our response at all. And finally, this is one of the first studies that was testing the feasibility and effectiveness of, of administering the resistant starch to snack food. Many of the studies you heard about earlier used the sachet approach. They use a powdered starch that could be sprinkled, sprinkled into yogurt or a soup or another food. Uh, but realistically, as Denise mentioned, we need to move this forward if it's going to be effective at a population level and see if we can actually administer it as, as a, a food item. So subjects were 40 healthy sedentary women 
They were randomized to a double-blind crossover study design. The resistant starch was consumed as a snack food, in this case cookies. Again, we used three doses, 0, 15, and 30 grams of resistant starch per day. All women consumed all doses in, in four-week treatment arms with a four-week washout in between. So if you do the math with that, any one woman could be in the study for up to six months. This was a fairly demanding study. They had to undergo an insulin sensitivity test using the intravenous glucose tolerance test at the end of each of the four-week treatment arms. So we did have a number of women drop out of the study. We tried to replace them as best as we could, um, but that ended up being one of the limitations of the study. We, the women were asked to consume two baggies. You can, the, what it, we're, you're looking at here is a photograph of the, there we go, the actual food product that the women consumed. Um, these are one ounce baggies of cookies. This is the lemon cookie. Um, we received the cookies from the manufacturer in large foil pouches and our metabolic kitchen staff weighed them out individually into one ounce portion. The women were asked to consume two of these per day. They came to the clinic once a week to pick up their supply for the week. Any one woman then would have consumed 168 baggies of cookies during the course of the study, and our metabolic kitchen staff weighed out, this is a conservative estimate, approximately 7,000 baggies. So the statistical analysis, we, as I mentioned, we use a Gaussian approach to objectively assess whether the women were insulin resistant or insulin sensitive. We then used mixed, model, mixed effects modeling to identify predictors of insulin sensitivity. And so this would be the various starch doses. We also included a number of covariates. And we adjusted for waist circumference because both obesity and abdominal fat are known to affect insulin sensitivity. And we also adjusted for completer status. This is whether the women completed all three phases of the study. And our rationale was that if a woman stuck it out for six months, she was probably really diligent and really adherent. And she may actually have been better about consuming all of the cookies. Um, and in pr interim analysis, we had a significant effect of completer status. So that was one of our covariates. This shows you the distribution of insulin sensitivity across the participant population. Um, and what you can see is we had 75% of the women fell into this lower distribution here. The average insulin sensitivity was around four, but we had a smaller percentage of women, about 25%, that fell into this higher distribution of insulin sensitivity here with the, the median being around 13. These are the baseline characteristics of the participants by insulin sensitivity status. So insulin resistant here on the left side, insulin sensitive here. This is after the placebo arm. So they'd eaten cookies for four weeks, but it had no starch in it. Um, menopausal status was about equally distributed in insulin sensitive and insulin resistant. But what's striking if you look at the ethnic distribution, we had Caucasians and African Americans and virtually all of the women in the insulin sensitive group were white. So all of our African American participants fell into the insulin resistant category. Um, by design, insulin sensitivity was lower in the insulin resistant group, of course, and these women also had higher fasting insulin and higher fasting glucose. So these are the results of the study. This is the overall results from the mixed model design. And I'm showing you both the actual model on the right here, and then these are the adjusted means by starch dose on the left. So this is a little bit easier to look at. Um, this is 0, 15, and 30 grams per day. Again, tested after the completion of that particular arm. And what you can see is we got a, a statistically significant effect of the higher dose of resistant starch, the 30 grams per day, after adjusting for covariates. This is only within the insulin resistant women. We did the modeling separately within each group, and we did not get an effect within the insulin sensitive women. Um, we didn't see anything that suggested it, uh, an effect of resistant starch, but again, this was a much smaller group. 75% of the women were in this insulin resistant category. I mentioned that we were going to look at adiponectin. 
Um, th th these, these are the raw, unadjusted data looking at epidepinectin versus insulin sensitivity. And there's a number of confounding factors with adiponectin, such as obesity status and race, that I have not taken into account here. But what you can see is a very strong positive association, which is what we'd predict. This is what many studies have shown, of a high correlation between adiponectin and insulin sensitivity. When we looked overall to see if the resistant starch had an effect on adiponectin, in the whole group combined, we didn't see it nor did we see it if we looked just by a high insulin sensitivity or low insulin sensitivity. Uh, but what we did find is when we broke it down by ethnicity, we got a striking effect of resistant starch consumption on adiponectin. And those are the data you're looking at here. So here are the data from the black women with both groups of resistant starch, the 15 and the 30. We got a significant increase in adiponectin, um, nothing in the white women. Uh, and I met, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we and others have observed a strikingly lower insulin sensitivity in African Americans. So these data are shown here. These are the actual women that were in our study. And you can see that this is after the placebo arm of the starch. Uh, significantly lower insulin sensitivity in the black women. And the black women also had lower adiponectin, about twofold lower. So the white women had about uh, 14 micrograms per mil adiponectin, and the black women had about seven. If we looked, this is just looking at change in insulin sensitivity with starch treatment in black and white women now, and these are unadjusted data. Um, we don't, we're not really powered to do this. This is breaking it down into three groups, looking at insulin sensitive white, insulin resistant white, and black. So this is really more of a qualitative analysis, but it is interesting. Um, what we found, and these are totally unadjusted data, these are just raw data from the end of the three starch arms, we did get what is almost here a dose response with an increase in insulin sensitivity in the black women. It seems to go up a little bit at 15 and up more at 30. So it does suggest perhaps that the, the significant effect that we saw with resistant starch consumption at the low dose may have been driven by the black women. So in conclusion, consumption of resistant starch in the form of a snack food item was associated with improved insulin sensitivity in women who were insulin resistant at baseline. Um, this, in our hands, this was primarily our African American women, which is a group at increased risk for type 2 diabetes. Uh, we don't know if resistant starch is acting through adiponectin. It's, it's a provocative possibility that requires further testing. Um, and importantly, resistant starch may be an appropriate dietary ingredient to reduce risk for diabetes in women who are insulin resistant. There were a number of limitations of this study. Um, we fed them cookies, and the cookies were, based, were baked in a dough that contained added sugar and processed flour. So of course, it's possible that if we had used a more healthful matrix for the cookies, we might have seen different results. And that might be something to try in the future. Um, I mentioned that a number of women dropped out of the study, and that one of the main reasons was that they just couldn't eat two bags of cookies a day. It's a lot of cookies to eat. I mean, it sounds great, <laughs> and the cookies were really good, but surprisingly, that was one of the comments that they made. So maybe in the future, what I would think about doing was providing more variety in the delivery of the resistant starch. Um, and the women actually said they would have liked to have consumed the sachets, that they'd be totally okay with sprinkling a powder into their food. Um, acknowledgements, Ingredion Incorporated provided the support and the cookies for the study, and the core laboratories at UAB uh, provided a lot of support. This was really a demanding study to do, so uh, many thanks to our Diabetes Research Center, our Nutrition Obesity Research Center, and our Center for Clinical and Translational Science, Metabolic Kitchen, that provided, they met with the participants every week and gave them their cookies and weighed out all the cookies. Thank you. for having me here. It's been a real pleasure to attend this meeting.
And uh, first, uh, my disclosure, um, I have received in-kind support and some travel funds to attend this meeting from, ingredi from, from Ingredient, and that's shown here. Um, However, Ingredient did not um, participate in the design or concept of the studies, um, nor in the publication, nor in the presentation I'm about to give to you here. So. Okay, so I'm here as an advocate for the underrepresented majority. Uh, these are the bacteria that inhabit each of us. And you might have heard um, in the news or in the literature, uh, we have 10 times more bacterial cells in our body than we have actual somatic human cells in us. And if we add up all the genetic content of these microorganisms, this amounts to being 99% of all the genetic material in our bodies. So in terms of numbers, we have 10 trillion bacteria on us at any one time. The majority of these microbes are found in our digestive tract. And the number that are present in us each of us right now is more than the total number of people that have ever been on Earth. So it's no wonder that these microbes could potentially be affecting our health. And we've known for some time that these microorganisms do perform very important functions. Uh, they help metabolize our food, provide us with more energy, um, synthesize vitamins and amino acids, detoxify our foods and our medications, and largely through study of animals that lack exposure to any microorganisms in their lives, we know that these microbes on our, in our bodies um, are essential for proper immune function, intestinal development, um, and overall these microbes also protect against pathogens that we come into contact with. As we're learning more about these microbes in our intestine, we're also starting to appreciate that they're also connected or correlated and sometimes causative for a variety of uh, acute and chronic illnesses. So this figure here summarizes um, some connections we see between the composition, the bacterial species found in our intestines and uh, uh, gastrointestinal illness, as well as uh, immune and uh, a metabolic and other uh, conditions and uh, illnesses uh, in people. And of course, we're here uh, to think about diabetes and certainly uh, these microorganisms in, in a dysbiotic state um, are associated uh, with uh, changes in neurological function, for instance, uh, reduction in satiety, uh, metabolic function in our liver, adipose tissue, uh, lipid, lipidogenesis uh, in our muscle, and, and epithelial function in our intestine. And, and while some of these data are correlative, um, recent findings from, particularly from Jeff Gordon's group, Washington University, strongly suggest that um, there, can, there is a causative effect of an obesogenic <laughs> microbiota <clears throat> in our intestine and, and development of, of obesity. So what are the factors that guide the types of microorganisms we'd find in our intestine? Well, certainly our own individual genetics plays some role in the types of bacteria that inhabit our bodies. Um, our age, our microbiota changes from time of birth is through uh, adulthood into old age, um, our health, <clears throat> as well as our environment. But fortunately, and also um, very relevant to our discussion here at this meeting, is the role of diet as having a tremendous impact on the composition and function of our intestinal microbiota. And this is very well established uh, both in human and animal studies, so I just give a couple examples here. Um, in humans, if we look at healthy individuals um, and group them according to uh, rather having a plant-based carbohydrate-rich diet or an animal uh, protein and fat-based diet, the microbiota groups into two different categories. We call these enterotypes, shown here, and this is work out of University of Pennsylvania. Um, you see uh, two different patterns of microbiota in, in these healthy individuals. 
um, at a Paul O'Toole's group in uh, Cork in Ireland and in elderly populations. Um, this figure here is another PCA um, where we have the different colors or the different communities in which these elderly people were living. And the lines connect the diet to the total microbial composition um, in the stools of these individuals. So we see this connection between the diet and the composition of the intestinal microbiota of these uh, individuals. Very clearly, it comes out the role of diet in animal studies. So I show just one example here in the upper right. This is from my lab, uh, where mice were given either a high-fat, high-sugar diet or a polysaccharide, plant polysaccharide diet, uh, looking at the total microbiota. And it's each point here represents a different animal. And just to orient you to, to these different figures, the closer the points are to one another, more similar the microbial communities. And on the principal component one, we see this red and green difference. This is a diet difference, so the, the Western or the carbohydrate-rich diets. On the PC2, we see the effect of an additive uh, probiotic uh, lactobacillus into the diet of these animals, which has minor effects compared to the global change in the microbial composition of these animals as a result of different diet. So we're probably familiar with the demise of our uh, coral in the ocean, and I would kind of liken this to our intestinal microbiota in a dysbiotic state and in a less functional state we have with chronic disease um, and potentially different diets. And so that's shown here um, on the left, and we can see a reduction in diversity, introduction of invasive species, and a reduction overall ecosystem function of the coral as opposed to a healthy coral. So uh, we can use diet, and my example here um, is with providing fermentable carbohydrates to the microbes to help to bioremediate the microbiota in our intestine back to a healthier state. So I'm going to give a couple examples. One is a human study, one is an animal study from my, uh, from my lab, and particularly focusing on um, the uh, microbial response to diet. And the first example um, is part of a collaboration I have with uh, the um, Aarhus University and the lead investigator is Knut Eric Knutsen. And um, his collaborators performed a human study um, on individuals with metabolic syndrome, average age 60 years. Uh, and in this study, the individuals were given uh, crackers and bread enriched in a ravenous island in a resistant starch. Here's the design. A uh, total of 19 people completed the study, um, fed either uh, the high carbohydrate, this is the high fiber diet, or their normal diet, which is called the Western style diet. And um, really, the, uh, the, they're energy controlled and uh, controlled for different nutrients. Um, where the only difference, significant difference was uh, about threefold higher amount of fiber in the diet up to about, from 20 to about 70 grams per day. And so my role in the project has been to look at how or if the microbes have responded in these individuals um, to the addition of uh, this fiber to their diet. And there's a variety of approaches we can use to do this. Um, we're certainly benefited by the metaomics approaches because so few of these bacteria are actually culturable and easily studied in the laboratory. Um, so what we uh, um, what I'm did so far and what I'm going to focus on uh, is this just the taxonomic level, so telling you who's there. And to do this, we use a 16S rRNA gene. This is a gene found in all bacteria. It's a phylogenetic marker, allowing us to identify them and look at their evolutionary relationships. Um, so if the figure on the left summarizes uh, the microbial composition as a global whole among these different individuals. And each person has two arrows on this PCA. And uh, the start of the arrow is the start of the intervention. The end of the arrow is at the end. Um, and the red is the Western style diet, and the green is the high carbohydrate diet. So <clears throat> what you'll see is the majority of the individuals who had the high carbohydrate diet had a very dramatic change 
in their microbial composition in their stools, um, as opposed to the Western diet. And on to the right, uh, we also see a greater uh, variation in the response within a single person, for, for each person, showing, a, again, this is an alpha diver diversity metric on the right, showing a robust response to the fiber. So which microorganisms were changing in response to the rabbit's island resistant starch? Uh, remarkably, it was one taxon. It was a bifidobacterium that uh, was enriched uh, to the detriment of uh, a variety of other taxa in, in the, these individuals. Um, bifidobacterium, you might have uh, heard or seen on the side of your yogurt containers being a probiotic. Uh, some, some strains are certainly an um, important member of our intestinal microbiota. Um, it's a glycan degrading um, lactate acetate producing bacterium, so short chain fatty acid producer. And we've seen previously to be correlated with, positively correlated with GLP-1 production. Um, the predominance of bifidobacterium in these individuals was uh, uh, from evalidated by finding increased acetate in uh, the stools. Um, and uh, also what happens when bacteria produce acetate, other microbes in the intestine can convert this to butyrate, which is a very, and also a very important uh, short chain fatty acid um, uh, for metabolic health. And uh, <clears throat> this was also enriched in these individuals. Excuse me. So the <clears throat> second uh, example I have for you is a mouse study. Um, of course, with animals, we can, um, they are hypothesis generating, but we can also dig deeper into the mechanisms underlying the effects of these fermentable fibers. And this is a study um, formed in collaboration with Roy Martin and Carolyn Slupsky at uh, UC Davis. So these mice were given a high-fat diet, 45% uh, uh, fat, energy from fat, um, and an easily metabolizable starch for nine weeks. And uh, for the remaining uh, time in the study, for another six weeks, half of the mice were given uh, uh, type 2 resistant starch, and these were energy-controlled diets. Looking at the microbial response to the resistant starch at the end of the study, this is, these are sequel contents, um, so closest to the ileum and proximal colon. Um, again, we see a, a significant enrichment in this bifidobacterium taxa um, in the resistant starch fed animals. So just to orient you, um, this is the proportion of all the bacteria we identified in the, in the cecum of these animals. And um, on the left, we have the resistant starch control, uh, the control animals, and on the right, we have those animals fed resistant starch. Um, and you also see this uh, increase in uh, most animals here in, the, uh, in gold, and this is a, a taxon called allobaculum, and these bacteria produce butyrate. So we see this, again, this connection between bifidobacterium um, and butyrate producers. Uh, what about the physiological response of these, these mice to the inclusion of this type 2 resistant starch? We saw increased gene expression of proglucagon and PYY. We also saw a um, decrease in GIP or uh, glucose dependent insulotropic uh, peptide. Um, and we also saw a significant increase in both the serum and the adipose tissue uh, protein level for adiponectin. Interestingly, we also saw heightened immunity in the intestine of these animals, so both in the ileum and the cecum. We saw increased expression of antimicrobial protein, uh, reg 3 g as well as an increase in expression of PRRs, including TR, TLR2, TLR4, and the nods. So um, really suggesting there could be a real um, immune stimula stimulatory effect of this fiber. And uh, Carolyn Slupsky, an uh, NMR metabolomicist, um, has been participating in this work, as I mentioned, and she uh, looked at serum as well as cecal and uh, liver uh, metabolites and showing here just the response in the serum. Uh, so mice given this, these obese mice given the resistant starch um, have a very different serum metabolite profile. And one interesting finding is that we see a significant reduction in amino acids. 
um, and the serum of uh, the mice uh, given resistant starch. And I think this is notable because, in, uh, at least in one study, people with diabetes had heightened levels of uh, proline, citrulline, and ornithine. So here we see a potentially beneficial response with regard to amino acid metabolism. And so what we're able to do uh, now is uh, look for connections between the microbial responses, um, the, the organisms that are consuming and exposed to this, this resistant starch, and how this can be translated to physiological outcomes. Uh, so here, um, you probably can't read it in the back, we list all of the different taxa and the different uh, markers we measured, and wherever there's a star is indicating a significant correlation, positive uh, or negative correlation to each of um, these markers. So uh, really we're, where we are is in a frontier of translating how our diet um, is really connected to our health through the microorganisms that inhabit our intestine. So I'd say there's four major areas we're going to see um, advances in how this is uh, connecting. So certainly with carbohydrate metabolism and short-chain fatty acids and the roles of, roles of these short-chain fatty acids in our intestinal and systemic health, that was explained nicely by Mike, we have also amino acid and protein metabolism, um, maybe didn't really expect to find, giving this additional carbohydrate, how protein metabolism is changing in the intestine. Um, we also have the response of biometabolism and cholesterol metabolism. Um, it's time to talk about it today. We also see changes in, in, in lipid metabolism in this regard. And um, we uh, also find uh, changes in barrier function and, and heightened immunity in, as a result of working through the, uh, our diet, working through our intestinal microbiota. So just to leave you with a um, uh, couple comments. So the uh, fermentable fiber, which is, of course, the topic of this session, um, is going to be really working through um, microbial metabolism and how those microbes respond. But I would, I would even submit, we, I learned yesterday of how many different diets can actually improve uh, met metabolic health. And so I wonder if there is not a unifying factor and if uh, the, we get for a sort of conserved functional response of the microbiota, and I think that's something to, to consider. Maybe it's not just fiber, but other foods as well that are gonna be affecting our microbiota in, in a way that can improve our, our health. And um, so I think this provides new opportunities um, through understanding the mechanism, how these microbes are consuming our diet to uh, manage and improve our health. Um, so uh, just to acknowledge, uh, Mary Moore, Javad Barowi, and Yusin Say uh, did the work in my lab, and my collaborators are listed on the right. The, the mouse study was, was funded by American Diabetes Association, and the human uh, study was uh, so, uh, performed with funds from the innovation funds from Denmark. Thank you. I was just wondering, I know we don't always look at, um, at insulin resistance um, in, in, a, in, a, in a sort of research fashion, but we'd probably perhaps use the metabolic syndrome. Did you by any chance classify your, your people by metabolic syndrome? And was there a, a, a difference in terms of your, your black and white percentage of metabolic syndrome people? I don't know, yes, it, is this thing on? No? Yeah, okay. Um, that's a really good idea. And no, we didn't. That's the short answer. We didn't look at it that way. But we have all the data. We ran lipids. Um, we probably have blood pressure from when they, their clinic visits, and we could potentially do that. So I'm going to put that on my to-do list. Thank you. Uh, so I, I very much enjoyed that. I have two questions, one to Michael and one to Denise. Actually, when you published your paper with Keith Frain in 2005, I believe, in Diabetologia, 
uh, this was what got us into the research on actually the non-digestible fiber and resistant fiber. So um, perhaps <laughs> we started at the same time in, in this field. Um, but my question to you would be, uh, as you have no response in diabetics and uh, GIP um, is a hormone which does not work in diabetics and may be related to some of those effects, did you measure GIP in those studies and would it be possible that you can explain those effects through effects of GIP on whatever intestinal or lipid or muscle related mechanism? Um, quick answer, no, we didn't measure JIP. Um, it, it could be a, a JIP related mechanism. We have measured JIP before in other groups and didn't find anything, which is why we didn't tend to measure it in the diabetic group because it's always a you know, it's always a balance with the amount of blood and funds and things. I would say the main reason we really think that, that the issue with the diabetes group is just the, the massive amount of background heterogeneity. When we have the, the healthy groups, obviously they're not as homogeneous as an animal group, but you can kind of narrow it down quite a lot by recruitment. But in the diabetic group, you have a, a group of individuals, and sometimes the only thing they have in common is a diagnosis of diabetes. They're so variable. And it was, you know, we've, we, we haven't done many studies in diabetes. That was one of the first ones. And we were quite surprised just the, the variability in simple insulin resistance, the variability in their insulin production. And these were all patients who had had diabetes for, for an average four years. So they weren't necessarily doing what the textbooks were telling us they, they should be doing. And I think the heterogeneity is probably the biggest issue because in some patients it worked beautifully and in others it didn't. And I think we need to try and get to the, the back. And it could, it could be the microbiota because that's, that's becoming a huge issue in diabetes. And we didn't measure it because it wasn't trendy when we were doing our grant. But in the future we would to try and narrow down responders and non-responders. Because well, if I may say a word to that, the, uh, actually we repeated your work with the re resistant starch and in that paper where you used uh, non-digestible and uh, non-soluble fiber, we saw the same effects as you described originally and we also had a group with resistant starch as a control which worked nicely, but we also used fiber which was non-fermentable and we saw the same effects. Yeah. So we can quite clearly, at least in those, we always get these about 17% improvement of insulin sensitivity best in perennial mm. related insulin sensitivity. Amazingly, it's not the liver. I don't understand that at all. Oh, so, so you find that as well? It's not the liver? Well, so as far as we have gone, yes, we, we see muscle in yeah. clams. We see it best. And, well, I don't know how the weight of the muscle goes. But second question to Michael. I always see this little arrow to AMPK. Is, could you detail the mechanism? I also saw that, I believe, in papers from you before, but I never saw any literature which really explains that. Yeah, that was, that was in the 2013 review in Journal Lipid Research. Uh, when I looked at it first, I thought, because usually that means lower energy and then you're responding. Um, so I'm not sure of that, of that mechanism, but it was, it was in that, that 2013 review. Those uh, arrows are always easy to draw, isn't it? Yeah, but it, and, and it was surprising because when Denise yeah. talked and, uh, and what you mentioned, no, no effect on the liver was all muscle mm. uptake. So what I said about maybe affecting gluconeogenesis in the liver, which was from that review article, that may not be true. It's all uptake. Yeah. Thank you very much. We have a question in front. A short one, please. Yeah. I'm Thomas Lin from Gießen, Germany. Uh, just a question to understand uh, regarding the um, inconsistency of the glycemic response and the heterogeneity of the diabetic patients. So what you aim at is really, as far as I understand, fermentation, right? So fermentation, would, would it make sense to quantitate this, for instance, by using hydrogen breath tests and then uh, identify additional factors that can explain these uh, non-consistent results, especially with the acute insulin response and insulin sensitivity that you showed? So would it make sense to, this is a question for all who are doing clinical studies, to make these hydrogenic, uh, hydrogen breath tests, do you think they, they would be positive in a, in a patient that is using resistance launch? I would say um, we have done hydrogen breath tests, so the, the patients are fermenting. It's not that you haven't got, they're not fermenting anything. I think that the difference is it may just be the, 
that the background microbiota may be very different. So a hydrogen breath test wouldn't be sensitive to that. We've measured um, plasma short chain fatty acids in, in various groups. And interestingly, the only group where we didn't find an increase was in the diabetic group. So, you know, in the healthies and the insulin resistance, you do see an increase in, in plasma short chains, but in the diabetic group, we didn't see. So there is something different about this group that, and, and nobody else has done any, any further work in them. So we, we need to, you know, do, do further work in this to work out, you know, what, what is it that is different that is not getting this expected response that we would expect based on the animal data, but also on the, the healthy human data as well. Gabriele Riccardi, Frederick II University of Naples. <clears throat> I have a question for Denise. Uh, you, you, one of, of, of the, inconsistency, the inconsistency in the results that you have shown might also be due to the methodology that you have employed <coughs> to evaluate insulin sensitivity. Because most of the study where you get a beneficial effect on insulin sensitivity, you utilize the insulin clamp. Conversely, you, you get negative or non-significant effect when you utilize the intravenous glucose tolerance test. Have you sought to the possibility that these two methods that we both utilize as interconvertible to measure insulin sensitivity, they in fact are measuring different aspects of insulin sensitivity. Also because in your diabetic patient, you still see that the, the, the arteriovenous difference in the muscles of glucose is improved after the, the resistance starch. So, I mean, the, the, there must be some metabolic effect that you are not able to evaluate with the method that you employ to, to measure the overall insulin sensitivity. Do you think this can be a reasonable or, or, or way of uh, interpreting, among other uh, ways, the, the inconsistency of your results? Okay, um, I would say with, with the, the diabetes group, we did use the clamp. So we, were, we weren't using the IVGTT. And obviously the, the clamp is, is seen as the gold standard. And, but you, you do have the situation with a clamp where you are giving quite high doses of insulin. And the insulin that you get at, at plateau is much higher than what you would get sort of prandially after, after a meal. And you've also got no effects of, of, of the gut. And if there was a, an important gut factor in there that was having an effect, the clamp isn't going to look at that. It's only going to look directly at sort of peripheral metabolism. With the insulin resistant group, when we did it for four weeks, we were actually wanting to look at, at insulin secretion because a, another paper had, had come out in fibre that had found this effect. So we thought, well, maybe that's, maybe that's an explanation for our data as well, which is why we changed methodology at that point. We hadn't, there was no kind of conspiracy. We decided we actually wanted to look at insulin secretion and that would be the best model for this. And obviously the, the IBGT isn't gold standard for insulin sensitivity, but it is very well validated. And we wouldn't expect to go from a 20% improvement to potentially a decrease by cha changing the model like that. So I don't think it's necessarily the model, although I, I think it, it's more just in that group, we weren't, we hadn't given them it for as long. And, and it was only about 50% of them went up, whereas 50% of them didn't. So it could be, again, everyone, everyone might have their unique time frame and people are adapting it at different, a different rate. And, you know, we need longer. Thank you very much. Oh no, they're not. They're not. They're not the same. But in the in the in the diabetic group, which is the group we really couldn't translate it into, we did use clamp, and we used identical methodology to what we'd used in our insulin resistant group. Good. We have one last question here. Short one, please. Jenny Brand Miller, University of Sydney. Thank you for your presentations this morning. They were beautiful. It's, this is a comment. Instead of studying type two people. What about the most vulnerable group in the population, which is pregnant women? You have nine months, and, and in that time you see hard clinical outcomes. You see the birth weight, the body composition, you see whether they have gestational diabetes or not, and they're highly motivated to improve their own health as well as their babies. And you get the babies at the end to study and follow up. <laughs> <laughs> we all start as an embryo, so it's relevant to everybody. Can I just, answer that just 
Okay. They are not here today, but there's a study. Okay. It takes a long time. No. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that's coming. Okay. Do we have a smart comment comments here before we're closing? For a suggestion? It's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We're closing this session here. There will be a coffee break now. Thank you very much. Thank you.